Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Grandpa Millennial Vincent Franchini, here with Baby Boomer Charles Coulomb. <laughs> Woo, Baby Boomer. See, I, I guess that's because I'm amongst the youngest of my generation, and you're amongst the very oldest of yours. Yeah, I'm a wise old sage for my generation. Oh, that's right, and I'm just a, a little kid laughing and playing in my generation. Yes. Most of my generation are thinking back to past glories. Woodstock, the Monterey Festival, and Altamont. Well, all right, maybe not Altamont. That was a little bit of a problem. But other things. Kent State. Well, all right, not Kent State. But but, but the return of the Sea Caucus 7. Uh, the Big Chill. Uh, Field of Dreams. Oh, gosh, all those things reminding them of how wonderful they are or were or something. Field of Dreams, that's interesting inclusion there. Let's talk about that. Tell me about Field well, of Dreams. Well. I'm familiar with the movie. I know the movie. Kevin Costner, your favorite actor, of course. That's the one. My, they don't come more annoying than he. <laughs> no. Uh, he Remember, he played a uh, – his wife is an even more determined boomer than he is. Oh. And when they seek out James Earl Jones, who's sort of a, a – oh, gosh, who wrote Catcher of the Rye. I can't think of his name. I know it as well as Caldwell? my Caldwell? Sal or, oh, Salinger. Salinger, Salinger Sal yeah. yeah, not Pierre Salinger. He yeah. was uh, JFK's uh, mouthpiece. But uh, James Earl Jones plays a reclusive Salinger-like author. And so, uh, as you recall, Kevin Costner and his wife – Seek, seek him out as part of their vision quest, whatever the devil it is. And he goes, he says to them, you mean you're from the 60s? And Kevin Costner goes, well, uh, yeah, sort of. Go back while you still can. And he starts <laughs> pushing the insecticide at them. I, uh, I got a kick out of that. It's, he, it's just an interesting inclusion to me because it's all about baseball. If you build it, they will come. And then well, old-timey baseball, and you're not exactly the biggest baseball fan. I'm not, but it's the boomers' version of baseball. Looking at it as the last thing that was good about America, and blah, 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 blah. All that stuff. No, we, uh, we boomers do have a patriotism of our own. It's true. It's hard to believe it, considering some of the garbage that the uh, boomers in charge do. But nevertheless, it's there. Yeah, uh, that leads into uh, one of the comments uh, about you as a boomer. Uh, on a video, one of the videos we did on Star Spang it's called Star Spangled Crown and Love of Country, where you explain your love of country despite being a monarchist and how that's possible. A gentleman uh, left a comment. His name is Leslie Cuff. He says, Charles's love for America makes his monarchism look like LARPing. American patriotism and monarchism are mutually exclusive. Charles is just not as smart as he thinks he is. He's just That's probably true. He's just another deluded boomer at the end of the day. That could well be true. Another comment, uh, 11 months ago, uh, the same person also says, What a baby boomer. The American project has been doomed for a long time. Charles's generation does not understand how little social cohesion actually exists in younger generations. To them, America is barely a country, and it is certainly not a society. It's a market, an open platform for different tribes to compete against each other. When Charles does his road trips, I wonder if he drives through the ethnic ghettos. So, and But the, the, the final comment uh, from this gentleman a year ago... Uh, he says, I can binge on these videos all day. Wow. It seems Thank to me he's sending, he's sending mixed signals. But I have, in the interests of fairness and openness, I have to confess something. I spent most of my younger years in ghettos. Uh, I am a proud graduate of Guardian Angel School. Well, not a graduate because uh, – they were eighth grade, a graduate for that. But anyway, I was in sixth grade, the beautiful Guardian Angel School in Pacoima, California. 
which in my day was all black. And from that proud institution, I went on to two glorious years at Virgil Junior High in Central City, L.A., which was uh, black and Mexican. Whites were a small minority. It was very gang-ridden. It was very dangerous. Um, famous tale in my family history was when a... Uh, you see, in the other schools I'd been to, you always had to fight the school bully when you got there if you wanted to be left alone. But what made Virgil special was that it was at the... Um, uh, you might say the, it was like a spoken wheel for several gang territories. And most of the people there were associated with one gang or another. So this one gentleman, I won't mention his name, nor will I mention his gang, even though it was 18th Street, uh, he wanted a buck out of me every day. Well, I was not really interested in giving him a dollar a day, particularly because I didn't have a dollar a day. We were very po, living in the inner city, with very little ethnic cohesion, with very little pride in country. And so uh, I came home that day and I said, you know, Dad, I've got a problem because even if I beat this guy to a pulp, his gang will be all over me. And bear in mind, we had more stabbings than uh, most schools in the city to include the high schools. So what's a boy to do? Well, my father looked at me for a minute. This was 1972, to give you a little bit of understanding. Mm. My dad pulled out his wallet, took out $15, which was a lot of money back then. And he said, I want you to find the biggest gang-connected kid you can. And you pay him this money to put your friend in the, uh, in the hospital. Now, mind you, he was being, he wasn't, uh, how do I put this? It was a metaphor. He didn't mean it quite that way. But then he said, millions for defense, but not one red cent for tribute. So, what happened? I found the kid, and he was gang-connected, as my dad suggested would be a wise idea. He took the money, and when the fellow came to get his cut, I said he wasn't getting anything, he began to make menacing uh, motions toward me, and out comes the other much bigger kid, grabs him, pulls him away behind the building. And the funny thing was, I could see on that kid's face as he was dragged away, the sudden realization that it had all gone wrong, that I was supposed to be the one getting thumped, and instead it was going to be him. And that wasn't the way it was supposed to work at all. He looked very disappointed. I'll never forget the look on his face as it dawned on him that this wasn't the way it was supposed to go. Well, unfortunately... What neither my father nor I had figured out was that the kid who did the thumping was not alive to the rich metaphorical heritage of the English language, to the poetic use of hyperbole. In fact, he turned out to be something of a literalist. And he took, put him in the hospital to mean precisely that. I didn't really mean it that way. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And so uh, the Thumpies gang jumped on uh, the fellow who'd done the thumping, and their two gangs went to war, and it was a big thing. But it had nothing to do with me, and I never had to worry about another incident of that sort the rest of my glorious two years there. Why do I bring all this up? I have seen from the time I was very young some of the darkest things this country can produce. And I love it anyway. Why? Two reasons. Gratitude is the biggest. Having traveled all over the world, as I have, I have noticed that even our poor people have cell phones and feed I also know that the vast majority of the people here are the descendants of people who were either thrown out or couldn't make it elsewhere. The wretched masses yearning to breathe free. Now, mind you, I think that all of that was a bit of an illusion. But nevertheless, it was true economically. And this country has been very good to my family and me. 
And gratitude is a virtue, I think. I agree with you that thanks to the efforts of my generation, the people we've raised have no sense of gratitude. I agree. Absolutely. I agree that social cohesion has been ripped to shreds. You bet. But what if you've been raised by an alcoholic? Or a, um, a pimp? Just because you were raised badly doesn't mean you should take the failings of those who raised you as a pattern for your own life. You are absolutely right, Mr. Cuff. I don't say you're right in binging on, on my, my videos, our videos, I should say. Um, I don't say you're right to do that. And I don't say you're wrong when you call me a, what was it, woolly-headed boomer, or not as smart as I think I am. I'm sure you're right. But I am smart enough to have picked up on what was right and what was wrong in my upbringing and to try to compensate for what was wrong and build up what was right. If your generation had the lack of patriotism you, su you suggest, and I have no reason to think you're wrong, up to a certain point, it's the fault of your parents. After a certain point, it's your own fault. Patriotism, and this brings you to the second point, is a religious virtue. Yeah, so find that in Thomas Aquinas. And I say that as a non-Thomist. Even I know that. Patriotism is a religious virtue. And what, in what does that consist? Does it consist in waving the flag and saying we're number one, the last best hope of mankind, the shining city on the hill, the uh, uh, whatever? No. It consists in wanting to bring this country and its denizens to Christ and his church. That's patriotism. I'm not against waving the flag if you want to wave the flag. I'm not against not waving if you don't want to wave it. But make sure that whatever you do, it's based upon a real love for the place that sheltered you and gave you birth and not out of a cold, nasty, self-centered lack of love. That's not a good thing, no matter how you slice the, the dog or the bald-headed eagle in this case. But if you want to binge on these things, you keep binging. Just send some money our way. Amen to that. All right, what else we got? Your story of uh, bullying the bully and uh, giving that gentleman some comeuppance, it strangely reminds me of a recent development with our, our buddy Brian Sims, Mr. Scumbag <sighs> Politician. Yes, yes, He's yes. Defending women's rights by bullying women. Indeed, indeed. That's the way to do it. Sometimes you must destroy a village in order to save it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Sims is like these guys. I mean, that that I, personally, I I mean, I, I I don't know the man, and I probably am, am, am a happier person because of it. But uh, he just came across as a bully who likes beating up on old women and little girls. Uh, he's a misogynist, and he doesn't like women based on his behavior. So a person like that, I mean, frankly, uh, he's a schmuck. What kind of moron videotapes himself abusing somebody and then puts it up? Who does that? What, what, what kind of mentality does that? And, and again, this is something that always drives me a little crazy. I can see it when people do bad things for some personal advantage. I, I, I get it. I mean, it's not a good thing. You shouldn't do that. I, but I understand it. But when you do bad things that shoot you in the face because you're stupid, then, then you're a schmuck. And you see, schmucks should not be in positions of authority. Why? Because it's not just that they'll do bad things that harm others. They can screw up royally the machinery of governance itself. You see, 
They don't understand that they're stupid. And so they'll do things that are irrational and, and moronic. What, and, 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 and I, I have to say, the people of his constituency, if they don't catch on from his behavior now, then they deserve him. But what he really needs is to be taken away from the, the Capitol building in Harrisburg and sent to a major university, possibly the University of Pennsylvania at Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, and it's very close to where he lives. Send him there, find a safe place for him where he can have slinkies and Play-Doh and he can drink uh, chocolate milk, and watch videos of little animals and, and, and all that. And he, he needs to get calmed down and relax and chilled and then basically kept there uh, as, you know, sort of an Eloy male person of sorts. That's, uh, that's where he needs to be. I think uh, having him at the State House is a terrible, terrible disservice to the State House, to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia, and to himself, because he's the wrong, he's in the wrong place. You know, he's a square peg in a round hole, or vice versa. He needs to be someplace safe where he can't do any damage to himself or others. Wow. I don't even know what to say to that. I mean, I, you just can't handle that he is he he sees right through our broken values and fake morals. In quotes, broken values and fake morals. You I, I you can't handle that. You can't handle the truth. Uh, you know, <laughs> if that were the case, he would have been beaten to a pulp by a mob a long time ago. I mean, stop and think about this for a second. My reaction was, aren't there any men folk around those women? I'll tell you what, if those girls have been daughters of mine, or that old lady, my mother, and I was anywhere around there, and this big mouth moron starts giving them smack, he'd get some smack himself upside his head. Why, because you're a Bible bully? You're promoting no, inequality? Because, no, because you don't do that to my women folks. No? No. Not if you not if you want to get get through the day in a happy state. No, I think I think he's a big mouth. He's full of himself, and he's a bully. And like all bullies, he needs to be taken down a peg. Maybe he should come to L.A. and I can introduce him to some old friends. <laughs> Everyone's there right now. I just saw on Instagram um, Michael Voris, Leela Rose. I think Abby Johnson is down there too um, from. The unplanned movie. Um, she was the protagonist, the well, real life character. But yeah, well, this—I mean, this whole thing is so crazy. In Philadelphia, which used to be a great Catholic city, has gone to the dogs. Um, I remember the about oh ten years ago now, maybe longer. The Boy Scouts back before they were castrated. Uh, the Boy Scouts were uh, had this beautiful uh, local headquarters in Philadelphia that was uh, rented to them, time out of mind, for because it was on city property, for a dollar a year. But because of their discriminatory uh, membership practices, about atheists and gays and so forth, the city council voted to charge them market prices. Mm. So it was this kind of thing that eventually pushed the scouts over the edge. It wasn't just scouts getting cuckoo, although there was that too. We capitulated after a long campaign of harassment against them by uh, major companies that had formerly been uh, donors and by local, state, and federal government in, uh, in terms of their, uh, the military and so forth um, that had been one of scouting's major backers. Remember, once upon a time, scouting really promoted patriotism and love of country. But now that our, our leadership the older people in my generation uh, decided that their gonads were more important than their country. Um, well, it's all gone to hell. Hmm. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Sims, uh, Assemblyman Sims, uh, he comes from the same town that did all that against the scouts. So that may be why he was elected there. But you know what? If that's the case, Philadelphia 
is in a bad way. You think of what a tremendously wonderful collection of ethnicities it used to be. Irish and Italians and Germans and Lithuanians and Poles. Uh, gosh, the Mummers play Scrapple. Philadelphia Society, of course. The, it had as restrictive a society as any other major city in this country. Oh, it was a wonderful place, Philadelphia. And now it produces creatures like the Simsman. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, don't vote for schmucks. No schmucks. Well, Philadelphia has one thing going for it. It's got one of the best archbishops in the country. That is true. That is true. Okay. Let's hope that it's enough. Yeah. What else you got? Okay. Uh, time for a memes and dreams segment. Uh, we have something that oh, isn't what? a meme per se, but it is uh, absurd and ridiculous. So I thought it would be fun to talk about. I'm all for it. What we got? All right. going to put up on the screen... Picture. I came across this on Twitter, and this is uh, Kant's Critiques. Uh, and the publisher's note at the bottom, it says, This book is a product of its time and does not reflect the same values as it would if it were written today. Parents might wish to discuss with their children how views on race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and interpersonal relations have changed since this book was written before allowing them to read this classic work. Okay, I mentioned the type of person we call a schmuck. Now, there's another sort of person. The scientific name for such a person is a weenie. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little, little prissy-lipped uh, weenie. Oh, it's so awful! Another need, another person who needs a safe space. This, this weeniness which produces safe spaces and all this drivel. Um, look, what kind of people would you produce teaching them the critique of pure reason? I mean, mind you, I'm not a lover of Kant, okay? I don't like Kant. That's not the point. You present ideas on their own, not, oh, we're so wonderful. And if it doesn't, it's, we're already just so wonderful. I don't know why we're reading anything that was written before we came along anyway. I mean, we're just so perfect. We're so wonderful. We murder millions. And oh, oh, yeah, well, about that. But it's so good because there are millions that deserve to die. Or, no, I mean, they're infants. They can't, oh, they're inconvenient. That's it. I mean, what a bunch of moronic, stupid, bloody-handed, idiotic, nitwits uh, are in charge of this sort of stuff. And the, the students who are unfortunate enough to be tossed on them with virtually no real background in anything from their secondary education, they fall in amongst these, these weenie wolves. Uh, and that's a, there's a mixed metaphor for you, a wolf that's a weenie. Think about that. Anyway, they fall in among them. What are they going to be Except Eloy. And for those of you who don't know what Eloy are, let me explain. Because the Eloy are a wonderful metaphor for what we've become. In the Time Machine, both the uh, classic novel by H.G. Wells and the classic movie from 1960, I think, 59, starring Robert Taylor, the Eloy... We're a race of future people who are pretty and blonde and gentle and really stupid. And they didn't really know anything. They didn't really read anything. They spent all day playing. And when they weren't playing, they were eating. And that's the Eloy. And that's what we're producing. But see, there was a little problem with the Eloy. And that was, well, you may wonder who fed them because they weren't really capable of raising crops or really doing anything. So you may wonder where did their food come from? Well, their food would be mysteriously left every day. And they would eat their food and grow big and strong. But there weren't any old Eloy. There was a reason for that. And the reason was that once a day, a siren would sound. And like Pavlovian trained dogs, the Eloy would march 
into this big doorway that would open up. At a certain point, the doorway would close, leaving the Eloi, the majority, who hadn't made it in, outside to go back to their house and play. Well, what happened to the Eloi who went in? Well, there was another race of future people who weren't so pretty. In fact, they were downright ugly. They lived underground and only came out at night. They were called the Morlocks. And they raised the Eloi as cattle, and they ate them. So, I'm going to repeat what I have said earlier. We are raising America's children, and really all across the West, to be Eloi. And there are so many Morlocks out there. I can even imagine poor little Mr. Sims, little Assemblyman Sims, falling in amongst the Morlocks. I can imagine the moron that uh, came out that composed that warning on the count book. Next thing you know, he's just a pile of bones. Morlock chow. That's what we've become, Morlock chow. So don't let this happen to you, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be a schmuck and don't be a weenie. Don't do that. It's not good for you. If you find yourself going, oh, it's just so disturbing, and you don't really know what you're disturbed by, you're a weenie. Wow. Ad hominem, Charles. Gosh. You're really lashing out on this episode. I, I am lashing out. It's true. It's true. I'm acting out. Yeah. As we say. Yeah, I'm, I, I suppose I should have Ritalin to calm me down. Maybe. Yeah, but, uh, I'm yeah, I think probably some some sort of uh, sedative to relax me would be good. Okay. Uh, first two questions are from Neil Lari. Greetings, Vincenzo and Sir Charles. What are your feelings about the Knox Bible? Some people love it and others dislike it. Also, what is your opinion of the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition? I like it for ease of reading, but I'm wary of it because of its Protestant, origin, Protestant origins. Thanks. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I'll tell you, I just read the duet, frankly. I uh, I like a lot of what Monsignor Knox wrote, but, but uh, uh, there are various Catholic versions of the scriptures flying around. His, some of them before the council, like his, the confraternity version, the Navarra Bible, which came out afterwards. The New American is pretty bad, actually. Uh I have the same problems with the Catholic edition of the uh, RSV that you've got. Uh, I would just stick to the Douay. You know, it, 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 uh, and if you have any problem reading it, look up the big words. Hmm. That's why we've all, we've all got uh, smartphones now, so, so you can pull this thing out. Hmm. And if you don't know what uh, thou wantest means, you can look it up. Okay. I had a favorable impression of Knox Bible because Baronius Press uh, publishes it, and they have, like, they publish, like, I think I counted, like, 15 different versions of the Douay Rames Bible. And then they're very yeah. traditional press. And um, Yeah, uh, look, I'm not saying it's uh, it's evil. I'm giving you my personal preference. Yeah. I uh, Reading is hard, yeah, though, Charles. What's that? Reading, oh, reading is hard. Oh, oh, oh. Sometimes the words well, are not how we like them. The Eloi had that problem. And that's why they stopped reading. Okay, next question from Neil Lari. Yep. All during the lead up to Divine Mercy Sunday, I have seen all over in traditional Catholic circles, uh, me social media circles, about the Divine Mercy devotion being not valid. Can you explain why some people do not accept it? I stopped reading all of it because Tradcath ranting makes my head explode sometimes. Looking for an explanation why they feel this way. <sighs> I'm sorry, what was the question? Ah, yes. Well, I'll tell you. Firstly, it was pre-Vatican II. I mean, post-Vatican II, rather, that it was promulgated. It was pre-Vatican II that it happened. And before Vatican II, there, uh, it fell afoul of the authorities of Poland. But apparently the young Karol Wojtyla had uh, gotten acquainted with it back then, thought it was good, and when he was Pope, decided to resurrect it. 
and so he did. Um, I don't really have any trouble with it. Uh, it seems to me like a uh, fitting development from the Sacred Heart and the Precious Blood and all that, which I'm very much in favor of. Um, you know, not all devotion, not all devotions are for everybody. Uh, there's no law that says you have to accept every devotion. But as to whether it's valid, I'm not quite sure I know what, what's meant by that. A private devotion is just that, a private devotion. It's up to the church to approve them or disapprove them. Uh, you know, there was a movement back at the turn of the century about 18, the end last century, the late 1890s, to uh, have uh, images of Our Lady dressed as a priest. Well, that, that, that got jumped on because there's a huge difference between the mission of Our Lady and the mission of her son. Uh, the sacrificial priesthood is strictly Our Lord's business. Our Lady had no part in it. But that's the kind of devotion that gets condemned on a fairly regular basis. The uh, they had some problems with the uh, they had some problems with the uh, divine mercy devotion. I don't remember what they were, but the version that we have was uh, purged of whatever the problems were. So, as with everything else, uh, do whatever devotions you feel called to do. Make sure you do the rosary, whatever else you do. Uh, in terms of validity, I think they're talking about the indulgence. Whether it's you up to get the, one. It's up to the Pope to give indulgences. And if the Pope says something gets an indulgence, it gets an indulgence. Okay, next question is from a person with the alias, the first ginger kitten. Wow. Can you do a video specifically on anti pavelic and the uh or pavelic? Pavelic. Uh, is that a person? Yes, anti pavelic. Oh. Okay. And the clerical Catholic regime of the Ustashas in World War II. You have endorsed or given praise somewhat to Franco and Salazar, but would you, if you were in that time period, join the Ustasha movement or endorse them now? Why do you think such a religious regime such as Ustasha were so violent? Or is it Serbian propaganda? Okay, well, that's a very good question. And it, there's a lot of a lot of stuff involved, so we have to, as they say, unpack it. Yes. Uh, for starters, the Croats and the Serbs have been at each other's throats for a very long time. They each have a long laundry list of the terrible things that the other has done to them. So whenever you're discussing Croats and Serbs, you're immediately going into an area filled with minefields. And oddly enough, both metaphorically and physically. <laughs> uh, there's certainly been atrocities on both sides. And as is the human custom, one uh, fudges or soft pedals the... Uh, the uh, atrocities one's own people did and points out the many that were done to us, you say, whoever we happen to be. The, the Ustasha were Catholics in the sense that most Croatians are Catholic and they were nationalists. Uh, and so they promoted the church as a reflection of the Croatian spirit and nationality. But I think, as was the case to a degree with Sean Maras and some of his followers, and Miguel de Uramuno, uh, and the Russian Slavophiles, for that matter, their error, I think, was to see Catholicism's value as epitomizing the spirit of the Croatians, the French, the Spanish, or Orthodoxy, the Russians, rather than the other way around, i.e. Spain, France, Croatia, Russia have value to the degree that they reflect the faith, to the degree that their spirit is that of the faith, to that degree they have value, not the other way around. So uh, that kind of uh, nationalism I have a problem with. 
because it ends up using the faith rather than being used by it. Uh, would I have joined, would I endorse the Ustasha today? No, for the reason I've said. Would I have endorsed it or joined it then? I don't know. It would depend on a lot of things. I mean, if my family had been on the receiving end of uh, Serbian nastiness, uh, maybe. If they hadn't been, maybe not. Uh, similarly, you know, if I were a Serbian Orthodox, would I have been a Chetnik? I don't know. Depends whether my family had suffered or not. Uh, and the, the irony, of course, is that the Serbian Chetniks and the Croatian Ustasha, who were supposedly more Latvians, they had a lot in common. But that's always the case. You know, one of the funny things about the Croats and Serbs, a lot of other peoples like that, are you would think they hate each other. They, they, they can't wait to get away from each other, right? And yet, whenever you find large colonies of the one in the diaspora, in America or Australia or whatever, you'll find the other right there. Mm. I mean, it's amazing. San Pedro, California, a place I'm sure you know well. Lots of Serbs, lots of Croats. But why? Don't they hate each other? Wouldn't they go other places? Oh, yes, but we know each other, you know. <laughs> Dude, we, we may hate each other, but at least we know each other. Well, <laughs> that's wonderful. Human nature. I never tire of it. All right. You know the one thing that makes my fellow man tolerable to me? What? Knowing that I'm just like him. But if it weren't for that, oh, what a reign of terror. I would inflict on this planet. Mm. Okay, next question is from Michael. Okay, Michael. John Henry Newman's canonization is not far off. What is Charles C. Cardinal Newman's legacy to the church and world? And if there is one thing we could all learn from Cardinal Newman, what would it be? Well, uh, one of the big, of his big contributions, of course, uh, is being some of the inspiration for the Anglican Ordinaria without a doubt. Beyond that, um, he was a man who put a great store on being reasonable and gentlemanly uh, and humble. And where he proved this, he was in a, uh, a big fight with the Archbishop of Ireland, uh, sorry, the Archbishop of Toom in Ireland, John, uh, can't think of his last name, but anyway, he was the Archbishop of Toom in the last part of the 19th century. And they got into a big fight over the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Newman's reading of the thing was rather more liberal than the Archbishop's. Well, eventually, Leo XIII weighed in and found in favor of the Archbishop. Sir Cardinal Newman uh, admitted that he had been wrong. The Archbishop was right. And gave him a, uh, I forget what it was, it was a gift of some kind. Uh, to end the controversy. Well, Cardinal Newman was a brilliant man. And for a brilliant man to crawl down from a favored position and admit that he was wrong, that is an astonishing kind of humility. I mean, if you're stupid and you know it, it's not hard to say, oh, I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but usually if you're as brilliant as Cardinal Newman was, you only come to a considered position on a topic if you seriously looked into it. So, mm. so I think that's his. Uh, that's what we should take away from him is his, uh, and also his adherence to divine providence. You know, one of his poems that uh, is often a great comfort to me in today's insanity is "Lead Kindly Light." Mm. That's a famous one, and I recommend it highly if you're feeling confused. Yeah. Okay, next question uh, is from Victor. My wife and I often wonder where we should draw the line when it comes to introducing books, stories, and TV shows and movies to our three children that involve magic. Until now, we've taken the zero-tolerance approach. No magic, no way, no how. As time has gone on, however, I found myself wondering about certain series like the Narnia Tales by C.S. Lewis and the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings series by J.R.R. Tolkien and other fairy tales in general. 
One good priest I know told me he's fine with the concept of magic as long as it's in a fairy tale setting and as long as it is understood as something set apart, not for us ordinary folks. On the other hand, I've heard and read some liberal or different opinions on the matter. As a father, I'm concerned. Part of me would really love to introduce my kids to some good, timeless literature. As a Catholic, I take my role as a spiritual head of our household quite seriously. Seeing as the material being presented by Tumblr House seems to be bang on, I thought I'd run the question by you good folks. All right. Well, firstly, I want to thank you, Victor, for being such a conscientious father. Um, the ruin of your generation has been my generation not doing that. So, thanks. Uh, firstly, you've got to bear in mind that magic and all that sort of thing it's a big part of the the catholic milieu um it's where our folk tales and all that kind of thing came from uh catholicism is amongst many other things a religion of wonder and we tend to lose sight of that we shouldn't do that as far as lord of the rings and Narnia and all that go um I always, and, and believe me, you're the kind of father I can say this to. I always tell people when they ask me, is such and such a book suitable for my son or my daughter to read? I tell them, well, firstly, it depends on the children. And secondly, you should read the books yourselves and decide if it's what you want them to read. I suspect, A, that uh, you have read them or you wouldn't be thinking about recommending them. And B, you probably know your children, so you'll know the best way to present them. Uh, but I certainly encourage you to do just that. You know, my father, um, I can honestly say, introduced me to most of the intellectual interests I have. And he, he was a, a, a great believer that if you don't give kids good stuff, they'll pick up awful stuff on their own. You'll create a vacuum, you see, and crap will rush in to fill it. So you don't want to do that. You want to get your kids the best stuff to read possible, and that will have the added benefit of giving them respect for your opinion. Because if you just say, no, 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 you can only read whatever you would allow them to read, eventually they'll find out there's still other stuff there. That'll call into question not just your judgment on literature, but your judgment on everything. The worst thing you want is for to have you say any kind of uh, magical or fairy stories are evil, and then have them find out, A, that the church never taught that, B, that a lot of these things are delightful in and of themselves. If you go that route and they find that out, then sooner or later, everything you've taught them will come into question. And you don't want to do that. You want to be the guy they can believe because he gives measured arguments and doesn't just say, well, it's so because I say so. Um, so by all means, introduce them to the best literature you know. And use the, use the time, use this time to explore things you don't know. And if there's a uh, if there's any literature you've got a question about that you haven't read, well, then for heaven's sake, read it, and then decide whether or not this is something you want to expose your kids to. Okay, last question today is from Joshua. How did the transatlantic slave trade begin, and what was the church's attitude towards it? Also, how could Spain be so scrupulous in regards to the proper treatment? of the natives, as is evidenced by the decrees of Las Leyes de Burgos and Las Leyes Nuevas, as well as the famous Valladolid debates uh, that were assembled by the king himself and yet have no problem with enslaving Africans, that the lack of apparent explanation for this inconsisten inconsistency has vexed me for years. All right. Well, that's a good question. The first thing we got to bear in mind is that the west coast of Africa where most of the slaves came from was based upon the, the economy was heavily based upon the sale of slaves 
had been for a long time. The, uh, the West Coast was divided into a lot of little kingdoms, and these little kingdoms were perpetually at war. Now, these wars were rarely, if ever, to the death between two, two little states. They were conducted primarily to capture prisoners, to sell as slaves. Now, you might wonder, well, if they're all doing that, where are these slaves being sold? Where are they going? And the answer is, for a long time, they went to North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and so forth, in long caravans over the desert. And that was where they went. They went to cities like Timbuktu and so forth, Agad. But in the midst of all that, in about the mid-1400s, a group of tribes, Berber tribes called the Tuaregs, uh, threw off whatever kind of masters they'd had and severed the caravan lines between the west coast of Africa and North Africa. What did that mean? It meant that all of a sudden you had all of these slaves on the west coast with nobody to buy them. But then the gods of commerce smiled upon the kings of the west coast and the white sails of the European appeared from beyond the sea. And suddenly there was a market to get rid of their human cargo. Now, um, was this a good thing? No. Did the church uh, protest against it from the beginning? Yes, they did. But why, you might ask, would they sanction the replacement of Indians with black slaves? Well, part of it was the nature of the society that the black slaves came from. The whole thing was based upon slavery. In other words, it's not as though only one or two or three of the little countries in West Africa were doing it. It was endemic. It was a part of the culture. Now, don't get me wrong. I doubt very much that people who were captured in these slave wars said, oh, well, it's our culture, I guess. We just live with it. I'm sure they weren't happy at all to be on the receiving end. But the point is they came, each of them, from countries that did this to the others. So uh, they did, the Europeans, in looking at the societies that they were faced with in West Africa, as opposed to the Indians, uh, figured that to some degree the evil of slavery was mitigated by the fact that it was considered normal in the area that these people were coming from. Kind of like abortion with us. I was going to say, yeah. I mean, if uh, there are a lot of us who don't particularly like abortion, but as we know, it's a sacred constitutional right, sanctified by the Supreme Court itself. So who are we to say it's wrong? And, you know, unfortunately, heathen nations like our own have these evils as part of the, the milieu. In the case of the Catholic nations coming to the New World, they were faced with a whole new set of problems. One of them being that it was very difficult to get Europeans to come over to the New World, uh, at least to get Spaniards or Frenchmen. It was always easy to get Englishmen, but it wasn't easy. To, and even there, they didn't want to go to the South because it was hot and uncomfortable unpleasant and the Indians were too devoted to their own freedom to uh, be useful workers so here you've got a whole set of little countries with the uh, greater society based upon the sale of slaves and don't think that they just sold all the slaves they kept them too so it's not like the, the slaves that were brought from the West Coast were coming from a free society into one that was, that was uh, enslaving. Yeah. They were coming from a society where they themselves may not have been slaves, but there were slaves. Uh, as I say, I'm sure becoming a slave was nobody's idea of a good time. Yeah. But it's, it wasn't alien to them. Okay. Okay, is that it for that question? Yeah, I guess that's it. Okay, uh, on to the book. Since we had so many new people, uh, we have so many new subscribers uh, since our last video, I thought we'd 
we do uh the most important book that there uh that we have Puritan's Empire by Charles. Yeah. Perrault. This person, oops, this person over here. There we go. Um, so you have a very different perspective on Catholic history. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that you say in there that aren't in most textbooks. Um, That's true. It's true. Even though as a boomer, I'm sort of a LARPer. Yeah, are you just LARPing? Or are you just trying to be edgy? Uh, yeah, pretty to much. Do yeah? Pushing the envelope. You know? Yeah. So uh, No, it, it basically, I, I tried to recast uh, American history in a more Catholic and so more accurate manner. And then the, um, I mean, again, it, it kind of makes me giggle a little bit. Uh, our first questioner, uh, perhaps not having read the book, uh, didn't quite realize what I think of the cult of America that's grown up. Uh, in truth, one of the things that I think you'll get out of the book is that that cult has acted as a substitute, as a replacement even, for true patriotism. In other words, there's a difference between loving your mother because she's your mother and loving her because she's the personification of all virtues. Hmm. Now, you may think on some level that she is, because people tend to think that way about their mothers. But objectively speaking, if I were to ask you, do you think your mother is the personification of all virtues? You'd probably say, well, no. She's great. She's my mom. But, uh... but if you were at the point where, yes, my mother is the personification of all virtues, and if she weren't, I couldn't love her. Ah. Uh, that is the problem with the religion of the country. That's a perfect metaphor. Yeah, I think so. See, and, but that is the, the narrow perspective that the mainstream has to is always abiding by. Yep. And you sort of tear that down. Um, yep, I try. And so... You know, I, I don't know what what adjectives you kids are using nowadays. Where there's red pilled, woke, based, whatever. Cut. Okay, if you haven't Cut. read this, if you haven't read this yet, then you aren't that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um. So one, yeah, I love, I love how you trace there are certain recur recurring themes in our country that sort of evolve that you trace that I love. One of them is sort of the puritanical roots yeah. and the evolution of those puritanical roots and how they even impact us today. We don't like thinking of, about our country in those terms, but <laughs> we're a Protestant country <laughs> and our, yeah. our, our whole perspective a, 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 of religion is based on the Puritans. And we know on some level, although it still dominates us, we know on some level that it's it's crazy. You know, what's interesting is that all of the places that have produced Unitarianism have been Calvinist. Okay. Where, where are the Unitarians? Well, they're in New England, Old England, huh. Transylvania. Yeah. And who did they emerge from? Congregationalists in uh, in New England, the Congregationalists and uh, Presbyterians in England, and the Hungarian Reformed, yet another kind of Calvinist in Transylvania. So you've got, I mean, Unitarianism is the inevitable product of Calvinism over a long time. You go from this rigid belief system where you know, you, you, you're, you're stuck. There's nothing you can do to affect your salvation. You go all the way from that to a vague belief in niceness. But they're the two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Yeah. And they're just, I mean, if you're reacting to something, you're still into it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you just shrug and say, okay, that, that's not nice. Got to go the other route. You've got to be the opposite. I remember years ago, I was at a party in Hollywood, 
given by the uh, uh, extraordinary Tequila Mockingbird. And there was a fellow there she introduced me to who announced that he was the fallen away Unitarian. And he wasn't being funny. And I looked at it and I said, uh, well, I guess you didn't have too far to fall, did you? But he didn't, he just took the notice and says, yeah, my parents were all broken up when I left the church. But, you know, I had to do my own. I'm like, Shoot, please stop. But he was, he was into it. So he kept on going on and on and on about what a trauma it had been leaving the Unitarian church. Uh, you know how Unitarians start their prayers? How? To whom it may concern. <laughs> <laughs> You know how they cross themselves? How? In the name of the Father. <laughs> you heard about the Unitarian lady in Boston when she was asked, uh, you know, why don't you believe in the divinity of Christ? And she said, I could never believe in a God who named his only son after my God. Wow. Sad. Well... What are the three things Unitarians in this country have to believe in? What? The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. Uh, okay. What, one of these days, I, I keep saying this, you're going to get your comeuppance from the Unitarians when when California is sinking into the sea on that last lifeboat, there's going to be Unitarians, and you're going to try to <laughs> jump on that and you're gonna say, oh, it's Charles Coulomb. No. no. All right, fine. I'll give you one more then. Okay. What do you get when you cross the Unitarian with a Jehovah Witness? What? Someone who knocks on your door for no real reason. Gosh. Uh hi. <sighs> <laughs> well, you know you know who also made fun of them? It was Garrison Keeler. Yeah, your favorite yeah, the radio guy. Yeah. His fictional Lake Wobegon, according to the fictional history, was originally founded by Unitarian uh, Unitarian missionaries. <sighs> okay. He claimed that Wobegon was a Chippewa Indian word, meaning place where we stood in water up to our knees all day. Wobegon. <laughs> okay, anyhow, the other theme that I really liked from uh, Puritan's Empire is um, the, uh, you, you show the history of the, the relationship between the federal government and uh, states' rights. No. And one of my favorite parts the, um, is uh, you, liked to, you, you showed how Thomas Jefferson was the biggest advocate of states' rights. <laughs> this one. Until he became president, and then he, yeah. he tried to, to to squash states' rights. Same with well, Andrew, you know. same with Andrew Jackson, huge biggest proponent of states' rights. Let's go states, and then he became president. <laughs> Everything changes when Everything, you become the boss man. Once you get the big seat. Once, well, I mean, you know what that's like. I, I do know what that's like. You were constantly that. nagging your brother about the uh, the uh, conditions of the workmen south of the uh, below the thirty seventh floor, and you were always uh, always sending him uh, memos about uh, improving conditions for the staff and blah 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 blah. Well, now look, I bet you don't send yourself many memos like that, do you? Yeah, no, I, didn't I, think so. I learned the importance of the order, maintaining an order. <laughs> yes. You know, that all levels, you know, it needs to be, the top levels need to be happy. Trickle down, right? <laughs> Yo, know, happiness trickles down yeah. from the penthouse. I get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but no. Um... <laughs> I, like, I like the phrase, regardless of the, of the connection, happiness trickles down from the penthouse. Yes. <laughs> It does. So, but no, seriously, the the uh, so there we are. Uh, Puritan's uh, empire was a, a work of love, hmm. and yeah. it really was. I mean, our young friend in the beginning who was uh, miffed over my being patriotic. Um, I think you'll see just as you will in uh, in uh, uh, Star Spangled Crown, which is in a sense almost like a sequel. I think to a Puritan's empire. 
Um, I think you'll see that I believe in a patriotism and love of country that's based upon what's actually here. Just as, as I'm saying, you should love your mother because she's your mother. Yeah. She's the woman God selected from all eternity to give birth to you. And mind you, if she's a drunk or abusive or whatever, well, you still owe her certain things. Yeah. And above all, when you, th when you think to yourself, my gosh, how do I love that person? Well, if you reduce it to its barest minimum, love is wanting the very best for someone else. So if your mother were a drunk and all those other horrible things, you would want the best for her, that she not be a drunk anymore or whatever else she's doing. Uh, and ditto your father if, if, if that's what the problem was. And so it is with our country. And I go back to what I said originally. You show your love of country by wanting the best for her. But what's the best for your country? That she become Catholic and follow Christ. That, at the end of the day, is the best you can want for her. Um, and, and, you know, the thing also, and I'm not, I'm not bagging on uh, our friend alone, because his is not an uncommon uh an uncommon affliction but it sounded to me as though you almost took pride in not loving the country that's a very disturbing thing uh similarly you know when you say that uh, monarchism and patriotism are are opposed to one another well, not, I mean, I, I designed in the book the best possible monarchy I could. For this you start with crown. Yeah. Yeah. I, des I, I designed the best possible monarchy I could that would bring out all, as I see it anyway, the country's best, uh, best uh, features. It's almost like saying, that if your mother was a drunk and you would very much love to see her sober and functional. Oh, you don't, you, you, you can't love your mother because you don't love her the way she is. And wanting sobriety for her is, is absolutely opposed to loving her the way she is now. Well, <laughs> no, no. Wanting your mother to be the best thing she can be is not a contradiction. My, uh, I've been all over the country, and yes, Mr. Cuff, I have been in ethnic ghettos. As I say, I was raised in some pretty nasty places. Didn't change anything. Uh, even the horrific things I described at Virgil Junior High and Guardian Angel. I didn't mention the fact that there were a lot of really decent people in both places. Um, some of whom I still know. So maybe it comes with age or maybe it's a generational thing or who knows. But suffice to say that this country of ours with a strange old history and her mother headed rulership it's still the country God gave us to live in and to enjoy and we do enjoy it make no mistake make no mistake we do enjoy it and it's not just the country as a whole it's also the particular state that you happen to live in and it's not just the state it's that county you're in and it's not just the county it's the city it's not just the city either. It's your ward, your neighborhood, your precinct, or whatever it is you're in. Um, all of them are deserving of patriotism. All of them are deserving of love. Even, I mean, if you live in a wretched slum, you want the very best for it. Uh, maybe you want to move out of it, but if you can't, try to make it the best place you could be. The thing about the Knights of Columbus, uh, 
what do we know about them? They're very, very local. I mean, yeah, there's Supreme, and yeah, there's the State Council, there's all that stuff. But in terms of the way the Knights actually work, what do they really try to do? They try to make the parish or parishes that they work in the best that they can be. And yeah, they'll support state drives and national drives for different stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's not where the actual life of the Knights takes place. It takes place on the parish level. And, you know, if you, if you find, for instance, that you don't like the particular council that you're at, there, there are a bunch of old people. There are two answers to that. One is to find another one. The other is to see if you can get a bunch of your friends to go into the council with you. What if you did that? I mean, and uh, don't get me wrong, the, the Knights of Columbus, as we said in the last regular episode, have a lot of problems of their own right now. And a lot of them, some of them are not of their making, some of them are. But besides, just despite all that, it does an awful lot of real good, as I have to say this, as do the Knights of Peter Claver. So when you look at these sorts of, well, the Holy Name Society, you know, the, the Legion of Mary. I mean, you look at these societies, the Vincent de Paul Society, uh, they're, I mean, they're all rather different from each other and from the Knights of Columbus and Peter Claver, but they're all of them attempting to improve where they are. And if you look at the country and you say, it's beyond my, my helping, well, then other than praying for it and praying to its patroness, uh, Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception and doing that sort of thing. Well, then you focus on the state. But my state's too big. I live in California. All right, well, same, same. Focus on the county. But I live in L.A. County. All right, well, focus on the But I live in the city of Los Angeles. Okay, well, <laughs> then focus on the section of L.A. you live in. You know? I mean, how do you eat an elephant? The answer is one bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't try to swallow that pup a whole. Wow. <laughs> so that's it. And of course, again, get to know your country's history. And I, I will. I, I rarely plug my own stuff, but honestly, Puritan's Empire, even though I wrote it, is one of the best histories of the United States I have ever read. And I don't say it just because I wrote it. You know, one of the great things about being a writer, ladies and gentlemen, is that if there's a book that you yourself would really love to see, <laughs> write it. Write it. If you find that there's that there's a, a, a lacuna out there, you know, there just isn't really a a good book about the contribution of, uh, of Western Ukrainians to Los Angeles culture of the 1920s. You've got some insight into that particular topic. You get that down there. there you Write go. it, ladies and gentlemen, or at least post it. At least post it on the internet. Yeah. Do a website devoted to Ukrainian culture in Los Angeles in the 1920s. There are tons of websites like that. Do one of your own. There you go. Okay, uh, that'll do it for this episode. If you'd like to buy this book, uh, click the link on the screen that pops up right now to get it at Tumblr House for $25. Free shipping uh, on orders over $25. So you buy one more book, you get free shipping. Um, and that'll do it. Um, if you, oh, very importantly, since we have so many new people, if you'd like to send Charles a question on the show, uh, you can do so through the Tumblr House website, the contact us page, just send us in. Um, we get a lot of questions, so I can, I only ask a small fraction. However, if you do become a, a patron for a dollar a month, I, I've asked every single question we've ever received from a patron so far. I pr can proudly say that. So if you really want the question to be asked on the show, become a patron. Um, but I'm not going to ask any whacked out questions if it's really crazy and it's designed to uh, 
be wild. I'm not going to do that. But so far, I've asked every question. So that'll do it. Uh, we'll see you next time. And remember, if it's Monday, if it's off the menu. And also remember, the soul you save may be your own.